You've got mail. Hi Nathan, my name is Chad from Lafayette, USA. I did some research many years ago on breakout clones, and one that really stood out for me was one called Block. I tried getting it to run on Windows 10, but get nothing more than a blank white screen. My goal is to make a clone of this, but all I have to go on is this gameplay video. If you have the time, could you please have a look? Well Chad, I do have some time, and this sounds like a fun puzzle, so let's dive into it. Not to doubt the integrity of Chad, but I'm not prepared to just download a random executable off the Wayback Machine and run it on my main machine, so I'm going to throw it into a VM. And I just happen to have a Windows 7 one knocking around from a previous project. So it crashes, which isn't entirely unexpected. If it just worked, then you wouldn't be watching this video now. Opening it up under a debugger, and we can see this instruction here is failing, which is attempting to write to what looks like a legit address. The address itself is in the RSRC or resource section. Basically, in Windows, you can embed resources directly into the executable, and there's a whole bunch of functions for working with these. However, you normally only ever read from them, which is why it's kind of strange to be writing to them. Maybe 24 years ago, Windows was cool with this. Anyway, using a really great tool called CFF Explorer, it's possible to view and edit the section permissions of an executable. So we can see here it's read only because it has the flag image mem read, but we can change that to also make it writable. So it still crashes, but it crashes in a different place, which is all we can really ask for. I can see the crash as a null pointer dereference deep in the bowels of VBox disp 3 d which, after a quick search, sounds like it's something to do with VirtualBox. I have zero interest in debugging the VirtualBox software, as it doesn't get us any closer to our actual goal. The only choice I've got now is to cross my fingers, hope it's not malware, and run it on my host machine. Now I get a white screen, but it does accept user input as I can press escape to quit, and this is in line with what Chad described. A game that just shows a white screen, but still accepts user input, suggests to me that the rendering is knackered, so somewhere in the last quarter of a century, something has changed. So the question now is, how does the game do the rendering? We know from the initial email that it uses DirectX 3, a fine vintage, so this gives us a thread to pull on. I'm going to assume that the game uses DirectDraw, the Windows 2D rendering API from that era. And if we break open the game in Ghidra, an open source decompiler and disassembler, then we can see it does import the DDraw DLL, and from there it calls DirectDraw create, the canonical first function in setting up DirectDraw. Looking at the call site, this all seems like fairly standard DirectDraw setup, and I'll tell you for why. And I'll tell you for why. DirectDraw is based on COM, or the Component Object Model, and this is a Microsoft framework for allowing different software components to communicate with each other, regardless of the programming language they were built in. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of this today, but the way this reifies itself for us is... The game calls DirectDraw Create, which returns us to a pointer to an iDirectDraw object. This pointer actually points to another pointer, which in turn points to an array of function pointers for the iDirectDraw interface. Confused? Don't worry. If you know, then this is very much like a C++ V table. And if you don't know, then this is very much like a C++ V table. All it means is that when we see a function that's called from some offset from the dereference direct draw object, we can look this up in the old Microsoft SDK to figure out what function is called. So, for example, in the game, after creating the direct draw object, we call a function ox50 bytes in. Ox50 divided by 4, which is the size of a pointer in a 32 bit XE, is decimal 20. The 20th function in this list is set cooperative level, so now we know that this is the function being called. Doing this for all the objects, we can resolve all the function calls, and now we can see that this looks a lot like direct draw setup code. We're creating a palette, as well as a bunch of surfaces. Before we dig in, it would be really useful if the game wasn't in full screen. I'm going to want to be able to run tools whilst the game is running, and this is almost impossible when it's taken up the full screen. We can use a debugger to set a breakpoint on create window x, which is the Windows function for creating a window. And we can then use the debugger to modify the function arguments, for example changing the style to was pop-up and then the dimensions. However, we've got two problems here. One, we need to make these modifications every time we run the game, which isn't a great user experience. And two, we're also going to want to modify some of the direct draw setup as well as the window setup. My initial thinking is to patch the binary, which we can do in Ghidra. However, this is brittle and anything more than a few simple argument changes becomes quite tedious. What I really want to do is hook all the functions I care about, so the game thinks it's calling the legit version, but it actually calls mine instead. I can then inspect the arguments, change them, and even call the original function if necessary. So let's do that. 
We want the game to run our code, and there's several ways to do that, but we want one that is minimally intrusive. We want to be able to just double click the game as normal, and then our code silently gets loaded. So the easiest way to achieve that is still with patching. We can replace the first instructions the game runs with a jump to an unused section of the binary, affectionately known as a code cave, and then we can stuff our own assembly into that. The assembly I've written just calls load library, which will load a DLL for us, and by default it will search in the current directory for one. We need to give it the name of the DLL to load. We could write some assembly to build this string for us, but it's already getting quite cramped in this code cave. Or we could insert the string somewhere else in the binary. I've opted for neither, and instead I've just found the name of an existing DLL already in the binary. Here's user32.dll, and this is already a null terminated string, so if I just pass the address of this plus 4 to load library, it will try and load a file called 32.dll. We also have to recreate the instructions from the entry point that we trashed with our jump. In fact, I've had to spread this out over two code caves in order to fit everything in. But to summarise, when the game runs, it immediately jumps to our custom code, calls load library, re-executes any of the instructions that we had to patch out, and then immediately jumps back to the entry point after our patch. So the game is really none the wiser that it's loaded another library. And we can confirm this works by making a shared library called 32.dll with a function called dll main, which Windows will automatically call when it gets loaded. And from that, we can just write some text to a file. Okay, so we're basically done. First thing we need to do is hook create Windows XA so we can modify the window parameters and direct draw create so we can capture the direct draw primitives. Windows binary files have a concept called import address table or IAT. This is a structure that contains pointers to functions and DLLs the executable will need to import. Again, using CFF Explorer, we can find the IAT offset for create Windows XA. Now this is an old binary that was built without a lot of modern security options enabled, so we can simply take the base address of the game, OX400000, and add the offset, OX19120, and this will give us the IAT entry we want. We can prove this to ourselves by disassembling this address, and we can see it's create Windows XA. So we can write our own create Windows XA function with the same arguments, plus all these runes so it looks the same in the binary, and then we can overwrite the IAT entry to point to our function rather than the Windows one. The IAT is mapped in read-only memory, so we need to do a bit of manipulating to change the protection of this and then overwrite. As we're good citizens, we'll also revert the protection afterwards. When we call direct draw create, we get back a com object, or a pointer to a pointer to an array of function pointers. This actually makes things easier to hook. All we have to do is look up the index of the function we want to hook, which is always the order they appear in the com declaration, and then we just override that index in the function pointer array. So when we create our direct draw object, we can hook any functions we want. I also save off the original value in a map, so we can call these later if needed. Because the com code is called via C++, we have to make sure we copy the implicit this pointer in the hooked function and forward that on when we call the original, which leaves us with something horrific like this. So using our mini hooking framework to hook the various functions we care about, we can write their arguments and results to our log file. And create surfaces failing. Before we dig into why it is failing, we need to dig into what a surface actually is within the context of direct draw. A surface is an area of memory that stores graphical data. It's a direct draw abstraction and it supplies a bunch of functions for working with these. So the game wants to create a surface, which seems like a reasonable thing to want to do, but it's failing with DD uh, non-exclusive mode and hunting around for some more details we get operation requires the application to have exclusive mode, but the application does not have exclusive mode. Basically, in a full screen app, direct draw will create a surface representing the full screen and then give you exclusive access to that, which makes sense because if you're a full screen app then nothing else will get rendered so it'll just allow you to draw directly to the screen. But we're now in a windowed window which violates some of the preconditions because the game expects to always be run in full screen mode. I found an article from 2000 which explains how to move from exclusive mode to window mode so we need to implement this via our hooks. Some of it's easy, it involves skipping calls to functions that don't make sense in window mode or just changing some flags around and some of it is a bit more complex which we'll get to in a minute. I think I've fixed up enough to get things going. Perfect. It's still trying to render to the whole screen. Apparently I need to use a clipper to constrain the surface to the window. The question now is still, how does the game do its rendering? From my limited experience of direct draw, I expect it to use the blit function at some point. This allows you to copy blocks of data from one surface 
to another. So a hook, a skip and a jump later, we've got logging for the three blit functions. And we can see an initial call to blit with zero args, which I believe clears the surface, and then a bunch of blit fast calls. So I'm starting to see how this works. We clear the primary surface, blit a load of crap to it, and then flip it. The flip instructs Windows to swap the surface we've been blitting to with the one being rendered to the window. Let's take the step by step as there's two things we need to solve here. The first is the mechanics of rendering. Because we've switched from full screen mode, we don't get the auto surface flipping for us anymore. We can create our own secondary surface and then use all the hooked functions to make sure all the blit operations go to that. And then when the game calls flip, we can emulate this by blitting from the secondary surface to the primary one. The second issue is to solve what is actually being rendered. Tracing through the code and it seems that the source of the fast split is always this surface which gets loaded from a resource. Again, resources are just ways of embedding data into an executable and we can use CFF Explorer to view these. So bitmap.bump is a sprite sheet with all possible images. This makes sense because the fast split call is just blitting subsections of this. So each fast split call is actually drawing one sprite to the surface. However, even with all our changes, we're still getting a blank screen. I found the string bitmap.bump in the executable and tracing that through we end up to a call to load resource. However, when we stop here in the debugger, we can see that the function fails. It returns zero rather than a handle. Now the docs say to call get last error for extended error information. However, if we coerce the program to call that, it returns zero or the poorly named error success. So the function fails but won't tell us why, so we've only really got one choice now. I've painstakingly traced through the user32 DLL library, from load resource to load resource xw to a whole host of unnamed functions, and I've ended up at a call to gdi get bitmap bit size. This is an undocumented function, but it is in Reactos, an open source re-implementation of Windows, and looking at the source, it does indeed get the size in bits of a bitmap. Looking at the call site, we can see it compares the size of the image to some random small number, which fails, and then that percolates up the call stack to eventually cause load resource to fail. Now, I have no idea why this size check is failing on Windows 11, or why it worked on Windows 24 years ago. What I do know is that this function can just return a non-zero value, and it's all okay. In fact, as EAX is already non-zero when we enter, if we use our hooking function to just slap a load of ret instructions over it, then we get something to render. Okay, so it's still not perfect. It only renders part of the game, and in fact, moving the window reveals the whole game, which is not the most intuitive way to play. My assumption is that the game does some scaling based on the resolution, so maybe we can just trick the game into thinking the monitor resolution is the size of our window. To get the screen resolution, you call get system metrics, which we can hook to return the size of our window, and now we can see the game and even play it. Obviously it's not perfect, the colours are messed up, but it looks like the transparency has been replaced with this delightful magenta. So let's tackle this colour issue. Direct Draw uses something called palettes. The basic idea is that rather than encoding an RGB value for each pixel, you declare all the colours you want in an array, called a palette, and then each pixel just encodes an index into that array. So my assumption is that we're somehow not applying the palette correctly and searching around, it does seem that palettes don't work in windowed mode. So I've hooked all the palette code to get the palette data, and then I've manually applied that to the image data after it's loaded. And no change. <sighs> if I was just a bit more observant, and just compared this to the video I was given, then we can see actually all the colours are correct, except for the background. So I've just replaced all magenta with white, and it seems to work. Maybe the magenta was used to signify some sort of blending operation. Anyway, I've emailed this all over to Chad, and unsurprisingly, it doesn't work. I suspect I know what's going wrong, and after rebooting my PC to check, sure enough, on reboot, it also fails. A curio of Windows is that user32 is mapped into the same address in all running processes, and that address is set on first boot. So I've changed the code to find the location of user32 DLL and apply an offset. This also didn't work, except if Chad used a Windows 11 machine, which also makes sense. User32 DLL will look different on different versions of Windows. We don't want a dependency on a specific version of user32.dll, and we could egg hunt for the function, but there's no guarantee the assembly will look the same between different versions of Windows. Stepping back, ultimately, we just want to load the resource. So if we use CFF Explorer, we can dump the resource to file, and then using our hooking functions, we can just load it from the disk when the game asks for it. And this works, however the first level is now messed up, it thinks there's some weird invisible walls here. 
I've stared at this for a bit and I've seen my mistake. There's another resource called data, which is also a bitmap. And if we look closely, we can see it represents the game levels. What I was doing was returning the sprite map for all requested images. So it was just interpreting this as level data. A few more back and forth emails with Chad about some bug fixes and he seems happy that it works on his machine. He's attempting a modern rewrite of this. So I'll link his GitHub below. I've also released the hooking code for this project. It's pretty gnarly and not code I'd probably put on my CV. And it's certainly not perfect as it doesn't even do the initial patching, but some people might find it interesting. The code that I am more proud of, I also stream on Twitch and here on YouTube. We're currently building out a game from scratch in C++ and OpenGL and it's a lot of fun so you should come along. The final thing I'm interested in is this faux 3D effect. It can't be hard coded or pre-rendered as it works with user input. I took the bitmap image and went full art attack on it. This is an art attack. This is Art Attack! Turns out if you mess with the letters, then this affects how they get rendered in the user input. And in fact, it's using these small images here to fake the 3D letters by placing them on the black and white pixels of the characters. Cute. This was a fun deep dive into early 2000s game programming and hopefully showcases some of the intricacies involved in game preservation. However, if you want more low-level game reverse engineering, then you want to check out what I did with Sims 2.